Hold on fire. What's up, Mena Nerds? This will be a complete breakdown of the Armored Assault Tank, looking under the armor to see how it all worked, seeing how it evolved over the course of the Clone Wars, as both droids and clone forces learned the strengths and weaknesses of it, how it outlived the CIS, and end on some behind-the-scenes facts, pulling from all these different resources. The story of this tank starts with the Nymoidians and Trade Federation. If you want a full detailed history stretching back to the Old Republic and seeing how all the political machinations worked, check out the Nymoidian Species video. But to summarize, the Republic wanted to expand and incorporate the entire galaxy, but the ones that actually ventured into these dangerous areas were the merchants and traders. They needed to defend themselves, and the arm race between traders and pirates resulted in the Trade Federation having the largest standing army in the galaxy by the late Republic era. Factoid Armor Workshops, led by Watt Tambor and under the parent company of the Techno Union, which itself was a member of the Trade Federation, would produce most of the military equipment for what would later become the CIS. Everything from the E5 blasters produced by the hundreds of millions to the B1 and B2 droids themselves, as well as their vehicles from the STAP to MTT and AAT, as well as the larger droids that look like vehicles and ships like the OG-9 and Vulture. The most dangerous areas of the galaxy were in the Mid and Outer Rim, and secretly Newt Gunray knew that his mysterious Lord Darth Sidious was planning to drag the galaxy into war, and they would use the legitimate threat of pirates and marauders to legally build this military. To defend their on-world factories and worker cities, the AAT, MTT, PAC, and STAP all quickly went from design to rolling out of the factories in a matter of months. At a length of 9.75 meters, a width of 8.1 meters, and a height of 4.32 meters, it was about a Jawa longer than the TX-130 Sabre tank, and more than twice as wide and tall. Its most obvious weak stat is how slow it is. This is a tank intended to be supported by swarms of CIS units in the form of clankers on the ground and hive mind droid fighters and bombers overhead. But at 55 kilometers per hour, it is anywhere from four to six times slower than the Saber tank. And even the ATTE has a whole five kilometers per hour on its top speed. But this was nearly twice the speed of the MTT, which it was designed to escort into battle. And these several inches thick Durasteel armor meant it could take direct hits by high energy laser cannons and explosive rounds while being immune to small arms fire. If you look close, it is reinforced in key areas. It looks to be about a foot thick right near the cannon on the turret, while the front works like a plow to smash through any obstacles it might come across. From labor striking protesters on some outer rim world, to the thick forest foliage of Kashyyyk, being several feet thick and curving to form what they call the nose ram, while this entire section is rated to take direct rocket launcher strikes. Starting at the very top are the Control Command Receiver Antennas, which keep the Tank Commander in touch with the Nymoidians up in the Lucre Hulk, or later with their Battlefield General, be they Organic or T-Series Droid. The top hatch splits open in two halves, and the Tank Commander would sit in this low and rather comfy looking seat, using a viewfinder packed full of ballistic and environmental data, displayed in this red coloring with a red colored reticle. This digital camera targeting system is the only way they could see around them, so a rather simple solution is that the commander would simply stand up and calculate targeting data with their droid eyes. And it's the same idea behind this front hatch. So the actual AAT pilot, distinguished by the blue coloring, could stick their head out to navigate the battlefront. Obviously this is less than ideal, but it's good planning ahead to take both advantage of the digital displays so that they are not exposed, but still having this easy to use emergency backup. The other two droids are the left and right gunners, with this crew entering via this main hatchway that would drop down. And just in case the main gunner was sniped while raw viewing, one of these gunners could climb up from inside this space without having to exit and expose themselves to fire. And hopefully close that hatch before some clones sunk a three-pointer with a thermal detonator. The primary laser cannon pivots on this elevator, and the distance to the target is calculated with these rangefinders that are on each of the secondary laser arm cannons while general battlefront sensors surround the turret in the form of these rounded bulbs that stick out, right above the dedicated motor for rotating the turret itself. This tube section houses a pair of power generators that connect to the four-chambered multi-reactor power plant below, which is towards the bottom of the tank, which did make it susceptible to mines, but really there was no way around it. A mine was going to ruin their day no matter what system they put down there. And that generator energizes everything in the ship, running incredibly hot, so they added this air cooling intake system up front, but with this much heavier solid plate armor, they needed incredibly powerful repulsor systems, both in the form of this forward disc and about a hundred of these smaller repulsor coils. By shifting the amount of energy to these coil arrays across the rear of this shovel, the AAT can steer left and right, or just blast it forward and back. This section also contains the most unique feature, the six variable launcher tubes. The standard loadout contained 10 of these bunker buster high explosive shells for taking down buildings or natural fortifications. 
18 armor-piercing shells for taking on enemy vehicles, and 50 general-purpose high-energy shells, for use from everything from lighter armored targets to enemy infantry. With all three of these munitions passing through this energy cocooning chamber, an advanced tech of this era that we also see in the ATTE, which encases the shell with a layer of high-energy plasma, which both reduced the friction while flying through the air, and acted as a sort of shield-piercing technology, with the idea being that the plasma would be absorbed and burn out an enemy plasma shield, allowing the shell to continue on. If this all wasn't impressive enough, the Separatists had a streamlined logistics system built, so that when they fired all their shots, automated systems would quickly remove the entire foot section, and attach a fresh, fully loaded bottom half of the AAT, a process that can be done inside of a C-9979 landing craft, or up in a Lucre Hulk. And for blasting through pirates and later clone troopers, usually the smaller short-range blasters were enough. It also worked as a transport with these handles on the side, accommodating six B1s that could hop on and hold on for their 55 km per hour drive into the battlefront. For all this tech, the price tag of 75k is incredible, 10k less than the Sabre tank, and three-fourths the cost of an ATT. And with their first showings in test war games on remote planets, then to fighting off local resistance and pirate groups, the Trade Federation knew these things were ready for war. Remember, this army was completely legal. It's just using it as an invasion force that was a problem. Begin landing your troops. My lord, is that legal? I will make it legal. The column of overwhelming force with hundreds of vehicles and thousands of B-1 battle droids took over Theed and stormed the royal palace in a few hours. Once the Battle of Naboo began, we see the command structure of these larger tank battalions, with a commander overall signaling to the commanders of each individual tank. While this force is impressive, even shooting down the small and quick N-1 Starfighter, there was a major weak spot that seems to be right around the front opening hatch, where the armor is at its thinnest, still around 6 inches, but less than what we get up top or on that shovel plow. And since it is connected to smaller blasters, perhaps that opening hatch was a weak point, and if so, it's a pretty big design flaw. As these hits are catastrophic, maybe setting off a chain reaction with the payload, when it takes fire from the flash speeder's oversized cannon, and Gungan Boombas. On the plains of Naboo, we see another problem as an overzealous tank commander wants to kill Jar Jar, and he opens the top to expose the crew being perhaps the first of what would become countless exploits of this open-top practice. And a problem specific to these first-generation B1s, since they were slaved to the central computer system, the B1s went out, and the tanks became paperweights. You can actually see them slowly descending as the repulsors disengage. On Christophsis, the AV-7s prove powerful enough to take out the AATs at a great distance, their artillery shells hitting their mark and forcing the tank line to retreat, while later we see that their slow speed was paired with the expanding shield generation, a tactic which nearly won them the day, and surely was used successfully on other battlefronts. Later we see that many commanders were too confident in their ramming ability, Watch that. You were right. Next time, listen to orders. From the lack of discipline in the commanders, not understanding the terrain, panicking at the sight of a Jedi and being tricked into firing on each other, one of the first scenes of them being used in the Clone Wars mirrors what Crosshair would say in the months after the war was over. These tanks all have the same weakness. The droids operating them. By the way, what he must have hit to set it all ablaze are the main bolt generator, and then chain reaction into these series of laser charged batteries. These look like shells, but are actually packed full of energy to make a circuit that generates the main laser cannon bolt. In the jungles of Onderon, Ahsoka shares some of the tricks that the Republic had learned over these years, explaining why they need to disable both sections. You have to take out both chambers, otherwise the tank will remain operational. While Rex makes it look easy, showing how to use a simple grenade to remove the threat, or if they use an ion grenade, they could add it to their rebel ranks, which is exactly what they tried doing some nights after this training, and luckily Steela knew how to jumpstart it to get everything back online. When they put it to use, we see how it easily overruns bipedal targets, and it is unclear why there is a charging issue. Fire the gun! The gun is recharging! But it could be due to that complete ion attack shutdown. Maybe the battery array had only built up two shots worth of charge, and was just close to that third. Stila takes advantage of the open top system, sniping out commanders, and since so many of them prefer to view the battlefront with their own optic sensors, it makes me think that the camera screens inside were too limited, and their droid AI found that even with this risk, it must have been better overall to not rely on those screens. Over the course of the war, the AAT would inspire the HAGM, the heavy artillery version that was supposed to combine the power of an AV-7 and AAT. And then there was the defoliator deployment tank variant, which was made to support the defoliator weapon. 
This was much wider and with more support at the rear in order to accommodate that greater top-heavy weight. This weapon proved excellent against fleshy organics and the terrain filled with all sorts of dense plant life. Great thing about droids for troops is that they could operate in a blazing heat, didn't have to worry about breathing in smoke, and of course the weapon itself deprived the locals of a place to hide and set up ambushes, and was used to destroy the population's food supply if they were resistant to Separatist control. Over the course of the war, both sides realized that the ATTE was more powerful and able to adapt to nearly any environment. Even capable of vertical ascents of fortress walls and plateaus, and its main gun packed a greater punch than the AAT. Even with the plasma cocooning feature, it is said to be incapable of penetrating deflector shield projectors, while the Republic Walker tank could. And with that weak spot being exploited so often, it ended up being seen much like the droid army. Nothing impressive in of itself, but often effective by the sheer volume of them. Legendary stories of the AAT did not live on long after the war, while there were stories of ATTEs leveling entire mountains, and their insanely creative uses by the clone army. Though during the liberation of Ryloth, they would be used to expertly cut off an ATTE advance, taking out the lead tanks on a narrow mountain pass. It was only for the elite training of the ARF troopers and Master Windu's combat brilliance that used the nimble ATRTs to evade tank fire, get in close, and ruthlessly exploit weaknesses they had learned, putting a detonator right on top of that laser charge battery, and barraging the power generators on the side. This tank would take part in the near extinction of the Night Sisters, though the locals would overtake one and turn it into a mobile energy bow platform. And AATs were present right up to the final moments of the war, even touching down on Coruscant via the C9979 landing crafts. Even if Yoda did his part in taking out hundreds of them, perhaps even thousands that we just don't see, since each of these landing craft carries 114 of these tanks, tilted back to stack better, moving into position via these conveyor belts, and then descending down the main ramp. Even after the Separatist defeat, they weren't all destroyed, many of them were up-armored by the Empire to take the form of the Imperial Assault Tank. While it isn't confirmed that there's an AAT under there, it just makes sense that the Imps would put this thing to use instead of scrapping thousands of them that were still in perfect condition. And if you look close, everything is in the right spot, even the guns, so I think it's safe to say that they simply built up on the AAT. And the scenario we saw on Desix must have played out on hundreds of worlds across the galaxy, as countless local warlords would have popped up in the uneasy peace following the abrupt ending to the Clone Wars. Some would fight for stability, while others were just thugs and pirates that were eager to get their hands on military-grade tech. These months, and even some years into the Empire, AATs were still slugging it out on every terrain you could imagine, which is a testament to their reliability and or ease at repairing, as even up to 20 years after the droid shutdown and slaughter of the CIS leadership, there were many AATs painted in rebel colors floating across the battlefront. So that's it for the breakdown. As for behind the scenes facts, this function isn't mentioned in any of the source books, but there's this great recoil reduction feature with the barrel, something like a reciprocating recoil system. The AAT was actually thought up for the original rough draft of The Star Wars, and was going to show the Imp's presence on World. And while it was scrapped, when they were finally planning the invasion of Thede for the Phantom Menace, it morphed into the AAC, or Armored Attack Craft, and was going to look like an assault helicopter. In Battlefront, there were going to be AATs in the Imperial faction as well, and some modders have found this original source code that was abandoned. If you want to read up more on this tank yourself, pick up the Cross Sections book and Essential Guide to Warfare. Likes, comments, and shares are the best way to help me out. Subscribe if you want to see more, and check out the membership. But most important of all, remember, it doesn't matter how thick your armor is, if your enemy has plot-based weaponry. And the Force will be with you, always.